All right, Pam. Scott Harrington, nice job. You did it. Pulled it off. Titus, if you have a Bible there, turn to the book of Titus. And whether it's on your phone or you've got one sitting in front of you, that would be great. We could dismiss the kids to Children's Church over through the door here. And that's a four-year-old to fourth grade. You could make your way as we're turning uh, into Titus. Um, how many of you read through the book of Titus at least once this week? Let's see. Nice. That's good. All right. So you have another week to do it. It takes, uh, I think, uh, really, it's so little, like eight, ten minutes. And find a translation that's really easy to read. Just, like, do the message or something. And just to get the overall flow, read it like it's a letter, because that's what it was. It was a letter. Read it like that and kind of get the overall movement of what's happening in, in Titus. Uh, Paul said, if you have your Bible there, it's in verse 1, verse 5. So 1 to 4 is that intro that talks about who he is, who he's writing to, and he gives a blessing. That's almost every New Testament book starts that way, those three pieces. And then he just cuts the chase and actually says in verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. That's why I left you there. So Paul was friends with Titus, probably led Titus to the Lord, a little bit of a, a protege, but they knew each other pretty good. They've done some traveling together, probably even 15 years worth of time together. Um, they traveled to Jerusalem together. In fact, Paul would write a letter. I know he sent 2 Corinthians with Titus and sent it. So he really trusted Titus. But then he had this little island in the Mediterranean, and they were notoriously bad people. We saw that in, uh, in verse 12 of chapter 1. It says, one of the Cretans themselves, a prophet, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So it was a tough gig. And so Paul's like, okay, Titus, We've been having a lot of fun together. It's time. You, just, you need to go off on your own. And I need you to help set this church up. Don't really even just think one church, because on the island of Crete, there would be a couple fellowships. They're like home churches. That's how they all started. And so a town could have several of them, or the next town would have them. How do you bring order to this? He goes, it's a bit chaotic right now, but if you could add some order to it, that's what we're looking for. Put things in order. And that's what our topic is this morning, that we need to keep things and put things in order. Now, as I titled that, and I'm looking at that, I'd realize as much as I, I dislike, as much as most of us do, the words out of order when you see it on something. So I just did some quick Googling, and I read a few out of order signs. There was an escalator that was out of order, and it said, you know, to try to be more positive, it said this escalator it's now stairs. There's a given a positive twist to it, right? There was a glass door that wouldn't work, and rather than say doors out of order, it says glass door, now a window. Okay? So anything to avoid saying out of order, it's out of order. And that would be part of us too. It's very constructively to say, yeah, we're somewhat out of order. There's things that we can change. There's things that we need to do. Because everyone has ideas. I'm just literally thinking of the island of Crete. There's different opinions and thoughts and way worse than anything you and I have ever experienced because they don't even know what it should look like because they've never done it before. Crazy ideas and opinions coming in, we, when we differ, we differ really ultimately on pretty small things. But things that we hold close to ourselves, but truthfully won't really matter at the end of the day. These were bigger. These are big things that are going on. 
So we're going to deal with three things. I just pulled three out that are useful to us, not just as a church leader, church, but you and your family at work among friends. Three things that maybe might do well to put in order a little bit more than maybe it is already. Let's pray. Father, please help us to be aware of ourselves and possible need for change in our own hearts. Give us a willingness to listen and apply in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his family and believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach, must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he might be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and able to rebuke those who contradict it. Go back to five. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you may put in order what remained and appoint elders in every town. So there's elders. We talk theology of a thing called the priesthood of the believer. Priesthood of the believer means you, through faith in Jesus Christ, have equal access to God as I do right? That's priesthood of the believer. We do not believe that you go to an organization of a church where there is a priest and that we would have to go through that priest to get to God. We don't believe that. We believe that there is a priesthood of the believer in Jesus. You have direct equal access to God as I have. Okay, we get that. One application to that, misapplication that we will often have is that means I have this equal access to God and now I'm a part of this community of believers all over the world, it's all true, of the church, it's the one church, it's the universal church, And then we're like, I'll go to this church, or I'll go to this church, or today, how many believers don't have a local family church to be a part of? Oh, that's okay. A lot of churches are my church. Well, the way the New Testament has organized believers is there is one universal church that is correct, and they were all organized under local authority. Nobody's outside of it. There's a church, but there are churches, many local churches. Every believer is to be under the authority of a local church. Let that sit for a second. No, that's not really how we play that game because when we get mad or upset about something, off we go and there is absolutely a time in which God moves us from one fellowship to another. No doubt about that. He'll even use bad reasons to do it. Bad reasons for us. And he's like, no, you're going to be effective over there. But that time in between is very dangerous for a believer because we have never been meant to be outside of an under-shepherd. Well, many of us have been there, haven't we? That's a very difficult time. It's like, we could talk like a charismatic. You're, You're outside of that blessing of a local congregation and shepherd. That's dangerous. It's we are under, this is how he's organized the church. We've organized the church with elders, overseers. 
and you need to make sure they are of a certain quality because every believer will be under one. I don't know which one. You move somewhere, something goes on because of whatever reason, you slip out from it, and then you're under a different one. But we are all to be under the submission of the authority of a local church. There's a great joke. I only know a couple jokes. So when my kids would have somebody over and something triggers one, I'll say something like, oh, there's this guy that got hired to be over supplies at a mine. And my kids go, oh. And he looks, they look over at their friend and says, just, just run with it for a second. Just, just run with it. Because the mine joke is a standard. Uh, there's an airplane joke and there's a guy who cuts his finger in a hotel. Those are the three jokes. And uh, my kids will mix them all up. Drives me nuts. Tells me I have to keep telling them. Right? Because they get them mixed up. I have to keep telling the jokes. I'm going to give you the old classic church joke. Are you ready? This will be the first of many times that you'll hear this. It's the guy, you know it. You even know it. I'm just going to tell it anyway. There's the guy on the desert island that gets picked up, finally saved. And uh, he's been on that island a long time, and he's on the ship, and they're sailing away, and they're looking over the edge, and the captain goes, I see three huts. Why are there three huts? Weren't you the only one there? He goes, yeah. Yeah, The one on the left is my house. He goes, oh, okay. Okay. When next to it's my church, right? And the third one, he goes, yeah, the third one's the church I used to go to. <laughs> oh, you, know, you don't, actually don't have to laugh. I'm going to give you so many opportunities to laugh at that in the future. Churches are organized in a certain way, and it's very important that we understand that it is organized with elders... And they are the ones who have the responsibility and authority to see that it is run and organized the way it should be. It has some interesting phrases in here that we get caught up in quickly. Like we zero in fast when we could keep a step away for a moment and understand the context of what's being said. It says you need to appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Ah, now we're going to describe them. It's everyone, they're above reproach. It's a husband and one wife and whose children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery. Well, husband of one wife, and that's been, well, husband and wife and children aren't open to. So I remember we were doing some work up on the Navajo reservation, and there's a preacher there. And he said, we couldn't be, I couldn't be a pastor because I didn't have kids. Because the qualifications say your family, right, your kids, well, I don't have kids. And I'm like, wow, you got me on a technicality there. Well, same with the husband of one wife. It's, it's remarkable how we've interpreted over the years that it's husband and one wife. Well, you could absolutely never to have been married before. That's not what it says. And I can even give a very simple explanation that you would agree with that speaks of a previous wife. We don't even hold to the strict interpretation. And that's if the spouse dies. My mentor pastor, our mentors, Don Ingram... Um, he, his first wife died and successful pastor his son is in ministry also a mentor of ours his first wife passed when they were young we're talking about left with a young child well, wait a minute it says husband of one wife we get in so close so fast and we get so divisive on it no stand back a little bit Stand back. There is a beautiful description of a person here that very simply says, above reproach. Now we're describing their family. Oh my goodness, he has one wife, he has kids that aren't unruly. We're just describing a good family. Relax, that's what it is. It's describing a really good family. That's all. Truthfully, 
I don't know, I look at some of these, and I know plenty of elders, and myself included, he must not be arrogant, quick-tempered, eh, drunkard, violent, greedy for gain, hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. I resign. <laughs> so we pick favorites to disqualify people, yeah, it's, it's like it's just open, loose, and we're not lowering standards. And I think in many ways we're raising the standard. Because the standard is, this is good conversation. Am I ever going to violate one of these and be, all of a sudden, I'm all about I, this uh, profit for gain? Is there going to be a spirit of that in me in America today? It's in all of us. That's something we fight, is materialism. Quick-tempered? Yeah, you catch one of us as leaders when you're extremely tired and then hungry? You get an elder who's hungry. <laughs> that is the definition of hangry right there. That is, yeah, absolutely. So what do we do? Oh, you're immediately disqualified because you showed you're quick-tempered. Well, that because that is against the text. Oh, no, no, it's pattern. <laughs> it doesn't say that, but okay. Same thing. You and I should always be in conversation with one another to keep ourselves up to a good standard. So even think for a moment, when was the last time you've been approachable enough that somebody was able to say to you, hey, you know I've noticed this about you. And they name something. You seem to get angry at this or not very caring or loving or you're this. That should be regular conversation. That's low-hanging fruit. And it's beneficial to us that we keep each other accountable to these ways. Elders, even more so. Even more so. So its leaders certainly need to stay to a very high standard above reproach. It's very, very difficult. I'm not sure how they did it on Crete. I would love to see these first elders. Because some of these would be literally just nutcases. I mean, they've had no standard of morality, many of them. And so they get to that point, but then to maintain that level... There was a preacher that announced that there would be a brief meeting of the board immediately following a service. And as the board gathered, a stranger walked up as if he belonged. And the pastor's like, uh, can I help you? And he goes, yeah, well, this is the meeting of the board. And there was nobody more bored than me in your church service. So I'm assuming, and he goes, I'd love to meet somebody else that was more bored than I was. Well, I'll tell you, we have a lot of standards for a lot of us. And they're often not the same. You give me a, a man who lived... We just talked about this, uh, Augie. I think you and I talked about a little bit of this yesterday. You mentioned Augustine. Great example. Augustine, he lived horrible. Who knows how many, quote, marriages. But when we come to know Christ... Are not all things become new? Are we not a new creation? Are we not qualified to be an elder after that because you were previously? How about the technicality where a guy has been with a hundred people but never married to him? So now you fit this because I was never married to him. You see, we get down into the detail of this to hold on to points that can't be well justified. So back away for a minute and just say, I want all of us, and this is true of all of us, I want all of us to love the Lord and have short accounts with people and that you and I have the freedom to talk to one another and say, hey, you know what, I've noticed this about you and maybe, yeah, great, pray for me then. Let's work towards that you and I would be grace-filled, that we would be about restoration, 
constant improvement. It seems as though very often as church leaders are leaders for a long time, they will often, we, we, we will often plateau and yet we will increase in being more judgmental of others. But not about ourselves. Take a look at this next one. Liz, uh, lives disciplined and self-controlled. You'll notice a word change in verse 7. Because in verse 8, Five, it says, appoint elders in every town, but then verse 7 says, for an overseer is God's steward, must be above reproach, not arrogant, quick-tempered. Threw a different word in there. So is it overseer or is it elder? Well, Paul definitely uses the two interchangeably. That's kind of a, that's kind of a well-known thing. He'll in the same passage as he did here an overseer. So think in your mind a couple words that are very, very similar. Uh, Pastor shepherd. Pastor shepherd is the same word, but pastor shepherd, elder, overseer, bishop. They're all the same. Wouldn't it be great to be a bishop? Have a cool hat? (laughs) I I would like a big hat. I had a pointed hat as a kid in school. That's, that was different. That was different. They're the same. It's the same office. So we have, as a Baptist tradition, kind of the offices within a Baptist church. We, we are not governed by an elder board. We really don't even use the word elder. So we have deacons who are really to be servants. Deacons and deaconess. Deacon, that's what the word comes from, is servant, but very often our deacon board are the governing board. We don't have elders, but we do have pastors, but pastor can be interchange, pastor, overseer, elder. And I don't know how it's hit us. I don't know over the last 30 years. I don't know how it finally has sunk in. And so, especially with our group, Venture Church Network, the old Conservative Baptist Association, have changed and are finally aligning ourselves more with governance by an elder board, still congregationally appointed elder board, of which Pastor Elder is on that board. But he changes it here to overseer. Same word, semantics. And if you take a look, it says an overseer, as God's God's steward, must be above reproach, not arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent, greedy for gain, but hospitable. So eight, now we're going positive. Had the negative, arrogant, quick-tempered, drunkard, violent, greedy. Instead, hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. What we're describing are traits of being spirit-led. Not self, it's a self-control. There's a restraint to them. How do I live that way? How can you be that way as a parent? How can you be that way as a student in school? We want to be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. A.W. Tozer died in 1963, and he's often known as the modern-day prophet. He said this, we are too much influenced by the world and too little controlled by the Spirit. Romans 6 uses a word that's kind of a a theological word. It's yield. We are to yield ourselves to the Spirit. We listen to God's Word and we 
present ourselves. That's what some of our translations now use that word. It's present ourselves. We yield ourselves. We open our hands and let go to the Spirit. That's what I need more of. I have lots of standards that I'm trying to keep up with, and it's exhausting. It's for you too. As a mom, man, the checklist every day, the things you've got to keep up with and all that you have to do, it's so exhausting. And then you add that the very simple, practical, I'm hungry or I'm tired. And now the checklist is really, and you're like, I just want to, I don't know, I just want to kill someone, I'll feel better. So which kid's coming in the room first? You know, it's like, I'm just, how do I keep this list? How do I at school when you're putting up with or at work, people are scheming against and there's so much to do and there's so much to be. And then we're pointing it out in each other. That's my list for myself. But now I have your list for me. You have it too. You have standards. You do. You have standards that you're trying to keep to in business. You want to be a certain way. But then others have expectations on you. It's exhausting. How do I keep to this? Romans 6.13 says, Do not yield your members, yourself, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, as member of God's instruments for righteousness. Yield yourself to the Spirit. So tomorrow morning, it's waking up with our Bible, and we just sit for a moment. And if you're not in the habit of doing it, it doesn't take long. You sit for a moment and you say, God, I, I can't do this today. Well, I can get through my day and I'll get more annoyed and annoying as it goes. More frustrated. Until I just want to quit. But God, I'm, I'm committing my day to you and I want your Holy Spirit to move and guide me. You're my standard. It's what you want in me. Yes, I'm going to listen to other people and I'll listen to my own heart, but I want to do what you want me to do. And that we walk in his Holy Spirit. And we see that a little bit more in verse 9, because it's working its way to verse 9 that this elder who shouldn't be arrogant and quick-tempered and drunkard and violent and greedy needs to be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy discipline. Verse 9 now, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he would then be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. It's holding to God's word is the third point. I'm all for a good Christian conference, I guess. Good Christian book. I kind of like them as much as you do. I'll I'll pick one up and enjoy it. and Maybe a Christian magazine or whatever. But there is no substitute for God's Word in your life. This is it. Hold firmly to this. This is our guide. So we often have, I don't know, not a criticism, but we recognize certain Christian groups hold to things other than just the Bible. Well, the Catholic Church, well, they, they say it. It is the tradition of the church as well, the teaching of the popes, equal to that of scriptures. And we say... God's Word only, right? I mean, it's, this is it. We are as guilty of, as they are. We're just not as open about it. Right? 
It's the traditions of the church. It's very difficult for all of us. We are to hold firmly to God's Word. The message of God's Word never changes. Is that right? Are you with me on that? But what we do is hold firm to the message, and then as holding firm, our fingers grab hold of some methods also. And we hold firm to methods, things that we do, the way in which we show ourselves. And we get them mixed up. Because the truth is, our methods should always be changing. Methods change. Culture changes. We change. The way your grandkids, our grandkids, the younger, the way they think is very different than the way we were raised thinking. So our methods are different in reaching them than it would be of reaching us. Methods change. God's Word never, ever changes. The message here will always be, has to always be, the beautiful story of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He gave Himself to us. Virgin birth, which meant He, was, he is 100% God, He is 100% man. So now he's qualified. He lived a sinless life and he died as a substitute for you and for me. He died and when he rose from the dead, he made available life. John 10.10 10. He gave abundance of life through belief in him only. Do you believe that? Will you also believe that nothing should ever be in the way of that? <clears throat> if we foresee a method that is in the way of that message, we need to be willing to say, ah, I'm willing to give that up. <clears throat> if it makes the message more clear, let's stick with that. But we're not going to be that way if we're not that way personally. So it's waking up every day and opening His Word and saying, this is the anchor to my life and I'm going to read Your Word. I want You to speak into my heart and my life. I submit myself to Your Word. I'm going to live in accordance to Your Word today. And I'll do that in the morning and it's, it's getting into that frame of mind, right? You know what it is because you do it. You get into that frame of mind. God, not my way, but your way. Help me hate sin because some sin I like. I want to hate the things you hate. I want to love the things that you love. We get in this mindset. We're holding firmly to His Word. And then I get up I'm trying not to break it. And then a phone rings and they're mad at me. Or my car breaks down. And I'm like, ugh! And then I break out of it and now I'm back into walking the flesh. You and I need to walk in the Spirit every day, all day. That's difficult. One target, though. Faith in Jesus, walk in the Spirit. Hold firmly to God's Word. There are, there's a huge number of uh, word pictures for God's Word. And so I was kind of playing around looking at them. God's Word, here it is are used in the Bible as being a cleanser, a lamp as a guide, bread for the hungry, milk for the young, a mirror to reflect what we look like, fire, a hammer burns and breaks away evil, sweeter than honey, more desirable than gold, 
That's not all of them. So tomorrow, when we wake up, I love the daily bread. And if you read it, those are terrific. Now that they're in even larger print, I can use that at my age. I'm not against larger print. That's kind of nice. But daily bread's not the lamp to my feet. It directs me to it. It may expound on it, but it isn't. It isn't sweeter than honey. It isn't the hammer that's going to break evil into pieces. It's God's Word. And so here's Paul sending Titus into this rough crowd. And he's saying, okay, we've got to be organized. Let's get this thing fit. I mean, we, we need it looking better than it is because it's kind of a mess right now. And one of the things is leaders do need to have a high standard. And for some, that we're more concerned about maybe how I don't hold to it in little bits than we are about the overall point. That's a problem. Of course we agree it's a high standard. Sure hate to have to actually talk to people to find that out. Rather just check boxes. You could never have done this. You could never have done this. It's not true. God is all about restoration. Isn't it beautiful that you've turned things over to the Lord and those things are gone and they're not hanging on anymore? Beautiful standards that we keep. Live disciplined and self-controlled. And that final is the laying hold of God's Word. Uh, some years back, I was in, on a little boat, a little uh, fishing boat in Lake Erie. And it was me, my brother, it was another friend, and then the friend brought somebody who we didn't know, whatever. So it was the four of us. We're out in the middle of the lake. That's actually a pretty good-sized lake. So we're out in the middle of the lake, and... Um, Three of us jump into the water. And the kid that we didn't know is the one in the boat. Never crossed my mind, didn't really care. I didn't have a life preserver. It was back when I was younger, I didn't care. I mean, it's only 60 feet deep, so what could, what could possibly happen? So all of a sudden, this fourth character, boat starts and he takes off. Now, I'm just floating and watching. And I'm like, okay, that's hilarious. Turn around and come back. No. He's gone. And I'm not kidding. It was silent. The three of us, me, my brother, and my buddy Jamie, we're in the water literally not saying anything yet because our minds are racing. And then finally, I think it was my brother goes, so, um, <clears throat> Jamie, how well do you know that guy? <laughs> And he goes, uh, I'm learning. I'm learning more and more. <laughs> Honestly, just about out of sight, because we were down. So about out of sight, and then he turned around and came back. Whew. I want to treat every day of my life like without God's word, I am in that water without a life preserver. I don't want the false security of money. How many in this room could attest to the fact that money can be gone like that? Right? You may have a decent amount and it could be gone like there are so many of us have realized that. That family unit, it's so good, it's so perfect, like that. We're floating in water in life and there is, there is one preserver. It's God's Word, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's all there is. And I want to face my day that way. I want our leaders to face each day that way. As a parent, I want to send our kid to school that way every day. Don't be confident in what you look like. Don't be confident in how smart you are. Praise the Lord for those things. That's awesome. Let's enjoy it while it's there. But there's one reason why we stay afloat every single day. It's faith in Jesus Christ, and it's our commitment to hold firmly to God's Word. That's it.
That's it. And as much as you and I may believe that hearing it right now, by tomorrow afternoon or by Tuesday, we'll know whether or not we really believe it based on the discipline between now and Tuesday, now and Thursday. Because what's in our head of what we believe may not be what we actually practice the next few days. That's my challenge to myself. I can go a day or two outside of the word easy. Too easy. And I got to stop and go, nope. My dependency is on him and his word. You agree with that? Let's turn it over to the Lord then. Let's pray. Heads are bowed. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, your faith in Him, I pray that you do before you leave today. He is the life preserver. And for the rest of us, could we pause for this moment and just say, yeah, I'm going to increase that this week. My time and commitment to God's Word, I'm going to increase that. I'm going to pause it, go a little slower. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your word. We are so grateful. You're so good to us. I would pray that you would lay it on our hearts, a desire, a love, an eagerness to spend more time in your word, walking in your spirit every day. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.